Henry VIII is most famously known today for the fact he had six wives, and there were two of them unfortunate enough to find themselves beheaded inside the walls of the Tower of London. The king's wives are best remembered by the divorced beheaded died, divorced beheaded survived rhyme, but the fate of the wife that survived is incredibly interesting. In fact, after Catherine Parr was laid to rest, there was a significant and shocking degree of tampering with her remains, which led to her corpse being desecrated. The corpse of the Queen of England, which had been laid to rest for centuries, was disturbed, and even had teeth pulled out of her jaw. But why did this happen, and what is the story of the desecration of the body of Henry VIII's sixth queen? Remember to support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. Catherine Parr married Henry VIII on the 12th of July 1543 at Hampton Court Palace. She was different to Henry's other wives as she'd been married before, and it's clear the king, who lurched from disaster to disaster, wanted someone to look after him in his sixth wife. The married couple were third cousins once removed, and when Catherine became queen, she had a rather modest household. She was a talented writer who encouraged women to write their own scripture and also read the Bible, which was frowned upon at the time. She wrote a number of books based on religion, and when Henry VIII went on his final campaign to France in July 1544, Catherine was left as regent. She was in charge of the finances and provisions for the king's French campaign, and she was seen as a confident and strong queen and ruler in the king's absence. But the queen's religious views caused her to attract suspicion and trouble. Many anti-Protestant officials in the church, such as Stephen Gardner, the Bishop of Winchester, targeted her, and she was accused of turning the king too radically Protestant. But the king did reconcile with her, despite an arrest warrant being drawn up, but shortly before the king died, she was awarded a modest allowance of £7,000 a year to support herself following Henry's death. But four months after Henry VIII's death, Catherine Parr married Thomas Seymour, whom she had been linked with before the marriage to the king. They married in secret, but when their marriage was made public it shocked everyone. Catherine continued to publish more works, and at the age of 35 she became pregnant, giving birth to a daughter named Mary. But on the 5th of September 1548, at Sudley Castle, Catherine Parr died from what is believed to have been childbed fever, following giving birth. It was common at the time for mothers to contract this, as giving birth wasn't as hygienic as it is today. But two days after her passing, she was buried inside St Mary's Chapel, on the grounds of the very castle where she passed away. Her daughter was put into the household of Catherine Parr's close friend, Catherine Willoughby, the Dowager Duchess of Suffolk. But following her death, Catherine was left in her room at Sudley Castle for a short time, where her body was wrapped in cloth and was then placed inside a lead coffin. An impression was left in the soft lead which read, KP, Here lieth Queen Catherine, wife to King Henry VIII, and wife of Thomas, Lord of Sudley, High Admiral of England, and uncle to King Edward VI. At the funeral, Lady Jane Grey was a chief mourner, and it was considered the first Protestant service ever held in the country. But afterwards, Catherine Parr was laid to rest and was buried inside of the chapel, and she was left here for over 200 years untouched, but things did change. Sudley Castle following the Tudor period changed also, as when the English Civil War had come to an end, it was slighted by Oliver Cromwell and put beyond military use. But in the centuries following, there were a number of people who decided to disturb the resting place of Catherine Parr, the final queen of King Henry VIII. In the summer of 1782, it was said, Mr John Lucas, who occupied the land of Lord Rivers, where the ruins of the chapel stand, had the curiosity to rip up the top of the coffin, expecting to discover within it only the bones of a queen. But to his great surprise, he found the whole body wrapped in six or seven sear cloths of linen, entire and uncorrupted, although it had lain there upwards of 230 years. His unwarrantable curiosity led him to also make an incision through the sear cloth, which covered one of the arms of the corpse, the flesh of which at the time was white and moist. I was very displeased at the forwardness of Lucas, who of his own hand opened the coffin. It would have been quite sufficient to have found it, and then to have made a report of it. So a man living on the land of the Lord, who owned the land, decided to break into the coffin of Catherine Parr, and then inspect the body. But what he found was rather shocking. He did not find bones as you would expect, 
but instead found the almost perfectly preserved remains of Catherine Parr, as if she had just fallen asleep. It was then said that in the summer of the year following 1783, his lordship's business made it necessary for me and my son to be at Sudley Castle, and on being told what had been done the year before by Lucas, I directed the earth to be once more removed to satisfy my own curiosity. I found Lucas's account of the coffin and corpse to be just as he had represented them, with this difference that the body was now grown quite fetid, and the flesh where the incision had been made was brown and in a state of putrefaction, in consequence of the air having been let in upon it. The stench of the corpse made my son feel quite sick, whilst he copied the inscription which is on the lead of the coffin. He went through it, however, with great exactness. I afterwards decided that a stone slab should be placed over the grave to prevent any future and improper inspection. So to confirm morbid curiosities, the coffin of Catherine Parr had been opened once again to confirm what had happened. But when Mr Lucas opened the coffin initially, he had disturbed the remains to the point where because of his involvement, the remains of the Queen had now started to decay, not as they had done previously. Also where he made the incision into Catherine Parr's body, the decay had then set in and caused rot to happen. The Queen should have just been left, but also at this time, there was a more shocking desecration done to her body. Hair clippings were taken from her head, fabric was taken from the bridal dress she was wearing, which she was buried in, and also shockingly a tooth was ripped from her mouth. These artefacts can still be seen today at Sudley Castle on display. But this was not the only time that Catherine Parr's body would be interfered with and disturbed, as once again in 1792, a group of drunk people dug up her remains and then reburied her for some bizarre reason, upside down. But in the decades following this, the owner of Sudley Castle, Lord Chandos, took great steps to look after the remains of Catherine Parr. She was after all a Queen of England, and she was moved to a safer tomb. He also organised for the exhumation to be done properly by Reverend John Lates. He had been involved in repair work to Sudley's chapel and church, and upon the exhumation taking place it was said, after a considerable search, the coffin was found bottom upwards in a walled grave where it had been deposited. It was then removed to the Chandos vault, and we proceeded to examine the body. But the coffin having been opened so frequently, we found nothing but bare skeleton, except a few pieces of sear cloth, which were still found under the skull, and a dark coloured mass which provided to contain, when washed, a small quantity of hair, which exactly corresponded with some I already had. The roots of the ivy, which you may remember, grew in such protrusion on the walls of the chapel, had penetrated into the coffin, and completely filled the greater part of it. We then had different pieces of lead, which from time to time had been cut from the coffin, firmly nailed together, as to present the original form of the coffin, and it was placed on two large flat stones, by that side of Lord Chandos. The Queen must have been of low stature, as the lead which enclosed her corpse was but 5 feet 4 inches in length. So the fact Catherine Parr's tomb had been broken into on three occasions actually caused her remains to decay at a rather rapid rate. The first time it was opened, the cut made by John Lucas caused her skin to become decayed, and then as time went on, further disruption caused her corpse to rot even quicker. What baffles me is why they decided to break into the tomb of a queen, and it goes to show the lack of respect they had at the time for Catherine Parr. Even cutting off some of her hair and ripping out one of her teeth is shocking, and following the reburial of her in a proper tomb, the examination showed how the remains had been altered greatly since the initial opening. In around 25 years the remains had completely decayed, as before for centuries they had not shown any sign of decay or deterioration. The Church of St Mary's inside the walls of Sully Castle, where Catherine Parr lies today, is a remarkable building which was restored, and Catherine sits next to the altar in an elaborate marble tomb that outlines who she was and contains the same inscription that was placed on her initial memorial. The shocking desecration of the remains of the last Queen of Henry VIII shows how people could really be awful at some times. Once again, thanks for watching. To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. And once again, thank you so much for watching.